Iron Man 2. Iron Man 2. Basically your standard follow-up to Iron Man 1. Trailers! Man, they were awesome. There was ACDC's Razor's Edge going on in the background while Whiplash was building an arc reactor similar to Tony Stark's. God, this movie's going to be awesome, isn't it? It was okay. I loved it. It was it was a big heaping pile of okay. Not uh, well certain elements of it were better than the first one, but other elements were just kind of uh, were just kind of a downgrade, and I will explain that in a few minutes. But first of all, the story-wise, it takes place it takes place after Iron Man. It takes place about uh, six months after Iron Man One. I don't know, but but basically, Tony Stark has revealed to the world that he is Iron Man, and he's and he's basically living it up. He's he's living up the fame while at the same time. While at the same time continuing his uh, his crusade as Iron Man, and and at the same time he's building suits and suits, and he's while at the same time he's uh, he's completely outperforming any technological competition, and that does not sit well with his uh, business his foremost business rival Justin Hammer. Now at the same time. An old, an old enemy of his father's, or an old enemy of the Starks, is uh, is building his own arc reactor. So, so Tony Stark has to deal with this mysterious new enemy in the form of Ivan Vanko, while at the same time trying to trying to deal with with this uh, with the arc reactor actually killing him in a way um, because it is poisoning his blood with all the palladium in his system. Yeah, palladium, palladium poisoning. So. So yeah, it's ironic because the device that's keeping him alive is simultaneously killing him very slowly. So he's this is where we really get to see Tony Stark cut loose in terms of sheer irresponsibility. I mean, I mean he gets drunk. This he, is where you see Tony Stark at his lowest, I think. Well, yeah, because he really doesn't think he has anything left to lose. While at the same time, he uh, he hires a new he hires a new assistant in the form of Natalie Brushman, and and there may be more to her than meets the eye. Yeah, like what? Not exactly subtle. Transformers. And at the same time, the and at the same time, they are still trying to set up the the uh, the Avengers with Shield being being a prevalent presence in this movie, or at least Nick Fury being a prevalent presence in this movie. So yeah, looking at that, you can probably tell what the overriding problem is with this movie, is that some plots didn't really need to be here. I mean, this movie is a little a little packed. It's not quite packed to the brim. As it's not like Amazing Spider-Man 2, where you thought it was just really cluttered and clunky. Amazing Spider-Man 2 straight up sucks. This well, was in okay. Opinion, this but was okay. this one, I think, handled it a bit better. Oh, yeah, because, because they used all the characters effectively. They don't have any throwaway characters that I can think of. Um, it's not just well. It's not really that this is overloaded with plot lines so yeah, much it's, because it's just that a lot of the plot lines that they have. Be there. Yeah, and that actually, I think I think it was cl I, I'll there was all there's obviously the hero villain story that needed to be there. The Palladium thing I thought was a little bit iffy. I but I thought it I was... I, I didn't mind it. It didn't play a major role, per se. But it did provide the kind of arc of Tony Stark in this one, I guess. But And then there's Justin Hammer, which I thought was completely unnecessary. I don't know why they had him like that. Yeah, because you already had a, a villain in the form of Mickey Rourke as Ivan Vodka. But wasn't, wasn't, just, wasn't the guy who played Justin Hammer originally going to be Iron Man? I don't think so. Oh, maybe I'm not. Maybe not. Sam Rockwell? Yeah. I, I don't know, but let's get to the acting. Robert Downey Jr. is still fantastic as Tony Stark. He, he still has... maintains the charisma. He still maintains the the very the very dynamic personality of Tony Stark. And the fact that he gets to be a lot more irresponsible this time really allows him to cut loose more so than the first one, because the first one he really was gaining a lot this this great sense of responsibility. This one He's this a lot one more he, irresponsible. This one, he he's kind of reverting back to his old playboy, 
his old uh, his old childish playboy type persona because again he doesn't really feel like he has anything left to lose. And considering we didn't really see a whole lot of that in the first one, it it was nice to to see them kind of mix it up with the Tony Stark character. And in my opinion, you could argue that well maybe this is a step backward for the character. You could argue that it's actually a step forward because it shows that um, even when you don't think, even when he doesn't think there's anything to lose, he still needs to maintain that responsibility. Oh yeah, and his uh, and his <clears throat> and his basically uh, picking himself back up around the the halfway, no, not really the half, the two thirds yeah. point. The two thirds point is, in my opinion, feels all the more more rewarding. Gwyneth Paltrow is still is still excellent as uh, Pepper Potts. I thought she was a bit too complaining in this one. Well, to be fair, she did have ample things to complain about because he made her CEO and he was acting like a child. Well, yeah, but still, you've shown that she has a lot more patience than this. Well, <clears throat> the thing is, she has to run a company, and how can she run a company when, when Tony Stark is making a, a complete fool of himself on national TV? And that actually brings me to something to something I will, I will say is a downgrade from the first one, is that... While both Downey and Paltrow are still very good, the ad libbing and the dynamic between them feels kind of uh, forced. Same. No, not forced, not in the least, but it I feels kind forced. of samey. I mean, it feels. You don't feel like they grow as much as they should. Well, no, because it's, just, it's just the same thing they did in the first one, and it's except based, not as fresh this time around. It feels like they complain, they complain, they complain to each other, they try to reconcile, they never do, and then at the end, he saves her from an explosion or something. And they just kind of make up. Yeah, yeah. Their their relationship isn't really as uh, is not really as fresh, or or it's not nearly as much of a breath a breath of fresh air when it comes to superhero relationships this time around. It's not nearly as much as it was in the first one. But with that said, what did you think of Don Cheadle as Rhodey? I thought he was very good. I thought he was actually an upgrade from the from, from Terrence Howard. I thought since he was given more to do in this one. Uh, I thought it was actually more fitting for a good charismatic actor. You could tell. Okay, here's the thing. He he's kind of Tony Stark's foil. He's much more the calm and uh, very well put together guy that um, has a lot of discipline. While Tony while Tony Stark in this one at least is much more irresponsible. He's a lot louder and he's a lot more flashy. And you could tell he doesn't play by anybody else's rules other than his own. Well, that brings me to another issue: is that you don't really get a whole lot of them interacting with, with each other. And I, I have complete faith that Don Cheadle could play a very good Rhodey if they would just give him more reign over the character. But instead, this movie seems so preoccupied with everything else that they don't really get a chance to really showcase the relationship between Tony Stark and Rhodey. I think it's developed. I think the the simple actions that they make to and for each other um, are enough to imply that they have a very close relationship. Well, yeah, but again, because to, to me, Cheadle, just based on this movie, just based on this movie, and in comparison to Terrence Howard in the first movie, Cheadle didn't really really leave as much of an impact on me as Terrence Howard did. Well, I, I don't really remember Terrence Howard, honestly. Well, you I haven't seen the first yeah, one I in haven't, years. I haven't seen it in years, but I think... You, you can tell, I think what why he sticks with me is because you can tell that he does actually care about Tony Stark, even if he is being this kind of childish playboy, because he does everything in his power to keep the military from basically running over Tony Stark's front door to take his suits. He does everything in his power to do that. But, because, but again, you can see that kind of human side where he's pushed too far, he's pushed over his limit, over his tolerant level. Um, when Tony Stark acts, gets drunk and basically, yeah, makes a complete fool of himself. What do you think of a? Uh, see, I liked Sam Rockwell's character, but again, did he really need to be? Here? No, he didn't. I mean, Sam Rockwell, he he was funny when he was there, and I and I did like how he was this kind of uh, he was this kind of reverse, or not really reverse, but this kind of slightly more sinister and slightly more cynical version of Tony Stark. It's like Tony Stark if he sucked and he was evil. Yeah, I mean, he, he was very much like, oh, I, I really want to be like Tony Stark, and I 
I'm really jealous of him, so I hate him now. But the, the way that Rockwell plays it, the way the way that he is so smarmy, the the sort of smarmy charm that stop. Um, no. I mean, let me put it up. Put it back in. But the way that the way that they're the way that he kind of plays this this with a lot of uh, there, this is a very snarky performance that he gives, and I was. For a while, I was kind of kind of getting into it, but after a while, but after that while, I just had to ask, well, why? Whatever, is he there? whatever happened to Mickey Rourke as the bad guy? Because he was in all the trailers, and they made it look like it, it was just going to be him and Tony Stark squaring off. But instead, Mickey Rourke is actually pushed to the background a lot of the time, and and Justin Hammer turns out to be the poster boy of villainy, so to speak, because it's basically. I, I know they needed a means for Mickey Rourke to acquire all this technology and stuff, but I think they could have handled it better because they basically made Mickey Rourke, they made Whiplash um, his lackey in a sense. Like Even though Mickey Rourke does betray him, and it is very satisfying, I do believe that he plays to Justin Hammer a little bit too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that and that also brings me to, to what uh, the issue with Mickey Rourke's character is. I really liked Mickey Rourke, and overall, I liked the villains in this one more than I liked Jeff Bridges in the first one. But the thing is, the portrayal of Whiplash in this movie, and and the way that Mickey Rourke is a lot of the time very monosyllabic, and and not really that active for a he lot seems, of the time. He seems like he's in a melancholy. Well. Well, not really that, but he's he's just kind of locked away in Justin Hammer's garage, building his suits for a large chunk of the movie until they need him again for the climax. But but I'm just talking in terms of performances. I liked I liked these villains better than Jeff Bridges in the first one. But in terms of how they were utilized in the story, I think I think it could have been better. Yeah, because, that sounds about right. Because, like I said, Mickey Rourke's character Ivan Vanko is supposed to have this very personal vendetta against Tony Stark, and you see a bit of that when they square off in Monaco and when Tony Stark visits him in the prison cell. But, but after that, after that, they don't like really I was, get any um, interaction. Well, yeah, after that, he's literally shoved to the side until the writers need him again to fight Tony again in the climax. So that was a little bit disappointing, I thought. Okay, now here's the uh, elephant in the room. What do you think of Charles Johansson as okay. um, Black Widow? Well, no, here's one more one more thing. I, I I like Samuel L. Jackson as Nick Fury, but then you have Scarlett Johansson who just sucks. She sucks. I liked her. She was good. She is, I thought she played the double agent very well. She absolutely... She was terrible in this. Now, I will admit that there could have been oh, someone a lot better. It's kind of like how I felt with Catwoman in Dark Knight Rises. There could have been someone better, but for what they were given, I think both of them did very well. well I like Anne Hathaway as Shush. Catwoman better than this. Let me talk, stupid pothole. Anyway, as I was saying, I do think that they were get, that they did very well with what they were given, just like I... Just like I think of her in Captain America 2, I think she did good. I think she played her role very well, simply because, simply because this her role in this movie is much more as a double agent rather than an actual person. Because you see much more of the personal side in like the Avengers and also in Captain America 2, and she does very well there. But in this one, she doesn't really need that meant that much emotion, you know. She doesn't need to emote as much because this is basically her introduction as a badass spy. Well, yeah, but if she is this dope, if she is this this, uh, and she does kick ass whenever she does fight. Well, no, if she's meant to infiltrate infiltrate uh, Tony Stark's life and and play the part of his assistant, she kind of needs to emote more. She needs to to be more believable in the role of an assistant. That, I believe that, her. That way, that way, it would have been more. It, it would have been more of a twist when it turned out that she was a double agent. Instead, and I'm not just and I'm not just talking about this from a marketing perspective. Like this movie was marketed like, oh yeah, Scarlett Johansson's gonna play Black Widow. No, I'm not talking about that. That, but from the first minute she's on screen, you can tell, okay, she's okay. She's not really an assistant. She's not really named Natalie Rushman. So, she is so transparent, and so. and also the movie tries to. Tries to have her play this exotic spy, this this uh, 
Natalia, Joe, Joe, Natalia I, Romanov. No, Joe. no, shut up. And she does not look exotic in the least. She does not. She does not look the least bit edgy. For the role of Black Widow, you really needed someone better, like like maybe uh, Olga Kurylenko or Numi Rapace. Instead, you have Scarlett Johansson, who a looks like she just graduated from her Sweet Sixteen, and b I'm guessing. It would not shock me in the least if she was just thrown in there so they could say, we got Scarlett Johansson in our movie. Because even back then, Scarlett Johansson was a fairly big name. And it seems like they threw in Black Widow, they threw in Black Widow, or Scarlett Johansson as Black Widow, more for her popularity and, and combining that with the popularity of the character rather than any kind of artistic integrity. So... And that actually brings me to back to my biggest complaint with this movie is that the shield thing, Black Widow and anything having to do with shield feels completely unneeded in this movie. And that actually brings me to a problem that I'm going to have in Thor is that is that the whole shield thing and trying to set up the Avengers is not done for any kind of artistic purpose. It's done for commercial reasons. That's like, the whole point of these Marvel movies. Well, the first Iron Man didn't have to rely on on the shield subplot. The Incredible Hulk didn't have to rely on the shield subplot. They used the shield subplot in the Incredible Hulk. No, they don't. Wasn't wasn't it like a shield facility where they got the gamma things for apocalypse? No. No. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. No. Well, then I don't know. The but they use it for every other superhero. But they use it for every other Marvel movie ever. <sighs> no, they. They don't. They set up. Okay, here's the thing. Now, here's in the, every no, no, single shut. one, in every single one of the Marvel movies, there is a uh, bit of setup for the Avengers. Whether the it be credits. whether it be major or minor, there is a setup for the credits. In Captain America, there's the Tesseract. In this one, there's Nick Fury and Black Widow. And in Thor, there's the there's the God kind of thing. The co the God threats. No, in Thor, it was Agent Coulson and his little shield bunker trying to get Thor's hammer out of the ground. Same difference. Anyway, the whole it was the only reason they didn't go straight for the the Avengers is is for commercial reasons. So I don't think you have the right to complain about that. They didn't go for no, no. Here's the thing: just because they didn't do it in one or two of a seven or eight movie series doesn't mean that you can complain about that because it's set up in all the others. You're missing the point. What is the point then? The point is, this movie does not stand on its own as well as some of the other Marvel movies because again, the S.H.I.E.L.D. the shield subplot... It's an interconnected world. They could, have they could have utilized it better and that's the whole issue with this movie is that it can't really stand on its own too much. And, I'm, and I get the feeling that this could have been a really much more fascinating movie they they had some potentially good plot lines here, like like with Mickey Rourke and with and with Justin Hammer, and with with War Machine. War Machine could have been interesting, and and this whole this whole arms race, this whole uh, Iron Man arms race that they were kind of setting up. But that instead, was kind of, that that was kind of used more in Iron Man Three. But instead, they had they had the Shield subplot taking taking what could have been valuable development time away from those subplots. Just to say, oh yeah, look at Black Widow. How awesome is she going to be? Oh, look at Nick Fury. We have Nick Fury in our movie. And he just kind of shows up out of nowhere. I don't mind if you have something in the end credits to set up the to set up the Avengers. But don't let it interrupt what should be your hero's solo movie. So you would rather have S.H.I.E.L.D. come out of nowhere in the Avengers? Aside from end credit things, no, I don't mind Shield being mentioned in the other Marvel movies. Not, I just no, think... no, no, no. You, they need to have a physical presence in order to have future installments be believable. They had a physical presence in the first movie. Where Coulson? That was one guy. You needed to, you needed to at least set up these other characters that would be Im met very important in future installments. Oh my God, Iron Man two. Iron Man 2, it's, it's like they were completely distracted. It's like they had no confidence in being able to make in being able to make a sequel that would appropriately follow up something as well-received as Iron Man. Yeah, but they did do it. They did have... It was a very good continuation of the first Iron Man. It's okay, but it could have been better. It could have been... Everything could have been better. 
Yeah, yeah, but again, you're missing the point. Okay. It could have been better because if they had excised the shield plot from the main narrative. The sh- like I, said, the I shield plot- think the shield plot was very good. I think it was a good addition. I completely disagree. Black Widow should not have been in this movie. Scarlett Johansson should not have been Black Widow. Um, Nick Fury should not have been in this movie. If so, make it only a cameo. Or how about this? Bring Coulson back. That would have actually been a nice They did continue. bring Coulson back. And not Nick Fury. Just don't bring Nick Fury back. Don't bring him in until the Avengers. You Why? Don't, you don't have to bring him in. You don't have to bring in Nick Fury. You don't have to bring in Black Widow. Just just have an Iron Man movie with a little bit of S.H.I.E.L.D. stuff. Here, take take the first Iron Man movie. Maybe 5-10% of it was, was S.H.I.E.L.D. Okay, well take this movie where a whopping 30-40% to 40% was S.H.I.E.L.D. No, it's in which one? I mean, good God, it's it's distracting. It's distracting, it's... Well, according to you, then this would be Iron Man 2. 20% Tony Stark, 20% War Machine, 20% Ivan Vanko. Um, no, 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 I take that back. 20% Tony, No, I don't, 20%, care. I don't care about the shut other... Shut up, shut up, shut up. 20% uh, Ivan Vanko, 30%... Um, yeah, 30% Hammer, and 30% Shield. Is that how you see this movie? Yeah. Forget it. Forget it. I I can't do this. I, I'm not going to argue with you. What do you think of the action scenes? The action scenes were fine. They were awesome. I thought the last one was much better than the, than the Monaco one, because the Monaco one kind of left me empty. The Monaco one was, was set up, and the Monaco one was... But it was the only other one in the movie. <laughs> this movie is a very dialogue-heavy movie, now that I think about it. There isn't nearly as much action going on. It's mostly just the characters and the story. Well, the action itself is staged very well. The effects are appropriately good. I mean, I can't really complain about the CGI. Of course, the CGI and the practical effects are going to look good. It's just the story and the script is where this one really falls apart, in my opinion. Again, I don't dislike it. It's just that... You loved it when it first came out. Yes, but that was four years ago. Four years ago. Okay, whatever. Continue. So, final thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I liked it okay. It's not exactly one of my favorites. My favorite Iron Man. And I don't think it was... And I think in terms of the... Okay, here's the thing. The acting was good, but... And the action scenes were good. But the thing is... The stuff that they brought back from the first movie, like the ad living between between Tony and Pepper, and and stuff like that, it didn't really feel as fresh or new as it as as it did in the first movie. And whenever they tried to continue the story, it seems it seems like it seems like at the same time they were they were trying to get you into the Avengers. They were trying to say, oh. Oh, look at this shield. Take, let's let's go away from the Iron Man plot for a bit and go into the Avengers. Okay, I have another argument for that. So, you know how this is the only sequel movie from the original set of Marvel set of movies? Mm-hmm. If this movie wasn't made, do you think they could have gone into Avengers? With seamlessly? Yeah. No. Because they didn't set up shield enough. Shield didn't have enough of a physical presence in this setup world. Again, you could have you could have just had what they did with the first movie, with Shield being a much comparatively smaller presence. Yes, you could have, but then you would also have to have it in all the other Marvel setup movies to balance it out. I would argue I would argue it actually detracts from the Avengers because you have you have Shield already pre-established as this powerful organization in this movie. And that way, when you see this giant airship in the Avengers, it's less of a spectacle because you already know what this what this uh, what this group this what this organization is capable of. So, in my opinion, it would have actually been more beneficial if, if they had kept dropping hints of Shield like they did in the first movie, and and kept and not really blown their full load until Avengers, when they actually brought all these heroes together. So. Yeah, it was okay. It was, it was good. I liked it. I Probably liked my favorite Iron Man movie, I think. Because Iron Man 3 just seemed like mindless fun, which I don't really 
know, I just enjoy as much as this, but and Iron Man 1 and 2. You're going to have to watch Iron Man 3 again. Yeah, I know. Yep, yeah, that, that about sums it up. Sorry if we kind of... By the way, uh, one, th one thing that you can agree with, at least with this movie, is the Palladium poisoning subplot was handled a lot better than the Panic Attack subplot in Iron Man 3. I disagree. What? We'll end it on that note.